in the battle to win passengers on the Atlantic, European manufacturers chose a different route. Instead of size, they decided that speed was the essence of air travel. To get back in the race with America, Britain and France decided to pioneer new technologies to build a supersonic airliner, the Concorde. It was very radical. It really required a new approach to every part of the aeroplane. We could start off with systems that were essentially fairly conventional, but then we had to make them work in these rugged environments of high temperatures, high speeds, high altitudes. The engine intake was a very substantial part of the development program on Concorde, because in simple terms, the engine can't accept supersonic air going into it. The engine is designed to operate with subsonic air going into it. So even when Concorde is doing Mach 2, you have to find some way of slowing the air down so that it's presented to the engine face at roughly half the speed of sound. But you've got to do it efficiently, otherwise the fuel consumption would be horrendous. Developing Concorde's engines and air intakes was done by fitting an engine into the Bombay of a Vulcan bomber. The shape of Concorde's wing was another technical frontier which had to be explored. Britain had done a lot of research into the properties of delta wings in specially built research aircraft. A delta wing was chosen for Concorde. It had to be the right shape to cruise at over twice the speed of sound in the stratosphere, while remaining safe close to the ground at normal landing speed. More data about the performance of the wings was obtained from wind tunnel experiments in Britain and France. The breakthrough on the wing was to come up with a shape that gave us the combination of quite acceptable landing characteristics and very good supersonic efficiency. And the shape of the wing, both in its plan form and in its leading edge, are a major breakthrough. We were facing a new regime of flight, which nobody had experience of on civil aircraft, and even on military aircraft, some of the experience was quite limited. So we had to prove that the aircraft was safe at very high altitude, very high speed, very high temperatures. We had to prove that the materials could stand the, the loads, that the systems would keep the cabin cool. And that's where we used the fuel to keep the passengers cool. The heat from the inside of the cabin is put into the fuel. It makes the fuel hotter, but it keeps the cabin cooler. Cool enough to be just as comfortable as any aircraft you'd like to fly in. Concorde's droop nose was another pioneering step. The cost of developing these new technologies was high. It was borne equally by the French and British governments. We first of all tried to get America to join with us, but they wouldn't have it. They were only interested in Mark III. The speed of the aircraft, oddly enough, was fixed by the materials used in the aircraft construction. The light alloys deteriorate with increasing temperature, and at the temperature of about 120 degrees, is about the limit of deterioration that you can stand over the life of an airplane. At 120 degrees, temperature rise corresponds to Mark II. So Mark II becomes the highest speed that uh, the airplane should be allowed to fly. We never understood why the Americans wanted to go at Mark III. It was altogether too difficult. Building Concord in two countries, speaking two different languages, was difficult enough. Both France and Britain had assembly lines, and the parts had to be ferried between the various factories in the two countries. In an extraordinary aircraft, the Super Guppy, a converted Boeing Stratocruiser, it hinged in the middle of a cavernous hold. Concorde was built amid continuous controversy. Development costs rose to over five times the original estimate. When the prototypes were rolled out in 1967, there were already doubts about its economic viability. But they were largely ignored as the first flight approached, and there was a feeling of enormous pride in the technical achievement.
The world's airlines showed great interest. Once again, it seemed that they would have to buy Concords and go supersonic to compete for the VIP passengers on the Atlantic. Behind the public relations exercise, French and British test pilots were working up for their first flights on simulators. The simulator gave us ideas that in one or two areas, the airplane was difficult. And as it turned out, the airplane actually was very much easier to fly, which was one of the pleasant surprises, which came quite quickly, obviously. Brian Trubshaw and his crew of six are taxiing towards the turning circle. The first flight on 002 was quite exciting because we'd had some failures of our airspeed indicator. So having got it fixed, I thought, well, if it works this time, we'll go. And that's what we did. Full power and reheat. The French prototype 001 had flown a month previously. 002's first flight lasted just over 40 minutes. When we arrived at Fairford, both our very sensitive altimeters, radio altimeters they're called, failed. So the first landing had to be done without the benefit of this very accurate height information. But it, it was all right. We arrived perhaps one second early, but didn't damage anything. It was seven years before Concorde carried fair-paying passengers. Only Air France and British Airways turned their options into firm orders. In 1973, the massive increase in the price of oil cast further doubt on its economic viability. And then it was barred from operating on the route it was built for. The Atlantic. That abomination will never, never land at JFK Airport. The building shook. I held my ears. We dread one flight over our heads. If the French and the British made a mistake with this plane, we're sorry for them. But we do not want to and should not be forced to live under these conditions and the flight paths to Kennedy. I'm quite clear in my mind that if the American SST had survived, then the opposition on grounds of environmental issues would have been totally different. They would have been suppressed, and I will always be convinced that that was the, the case. the future. Because tomorrow, British Airways introduce Concorde, the first supersonic passenger airliner to fly you at more than twice the speed of sound. Concorde has crossed the Atlantic in three and a half hours. Only Britain and France bought Concorde. Sixteen aircraft were built. The first supersonic services were to South America and the Middle East in 1976. The following year, the American authorities let it land in the United States, and Concorde began carrying passengers across the Atlantic. In speed, Concorde has no rival. It routinely carries passengers over the Atlantic as fast as a bullet. But it has a rarer quality, the means to inspire. After years in service, heads still turn when it flies, and people are moved by its grace and beauty. Follow the acceleration on the flight information system at the front of the 
two cabins as the aircraft accelerates smoothly through Mark 1, the speed of sound. We'll be achieving Mark 2 as we pass through 50,000 feet. And we'll be putting that little lot together in just 30 seconds from now. Here we have this incredible aeroplane performing at these great, great speeds. But from a passenger's point of view, it is a smooth non-event. A magnificent example of that was on the proving flight on the way down to Bahrain. A passenger came up to the principal designer and said, you know, what's all this about twice the speed of sound? It's, uh, there's no drama, there's no bumps and bangs, no excitement in it. And the designer merely turned around and said, yes, that was the difficult part in the design. It gives the airline, firstly, a unique product. Secondly, it attracts to it very high yield traffic, i.e. that the upper echelons of the business world are our prime clients, and that must be good for the airline. We have got the people who are prepared to pay the premium rates for Concorde, and bear in mind that Concorde saves them time and saves them condition, and there is one thing that you cannot buy in life, and that is time. <laughs> 